So, well, a very good evening, everyone. Great to see you all and thank you for joining us and welcome to a new series of Scotch Watch, Uncovering Whiskey, one dram and one story at a time, live on Zoom to a, an audience across Europe and also live on Instagram over here. Uh, great to see you all. I'm Alex Robertson, uh, head of Chivas Brothers Inspirit Ambassador Team, and I'm delighted, as always, to be joined by my co-host, Director of Blending, Sandy Hislam. Sandy, how does it feel to be back? Oh, it's flipping great to be back at the Scotch Watch. And this is this is the first time ever we've been in the same room. We've always been remote in different areas. Um, big topic tonight, Alex. We've got maturation, we've got finishing. Goodness me, we could do a series on this. We're going to have to be uh, going at some rate tonight to cover all this information. Yeah, yeah, that is a big topic tonight. And we are delighted to be back, of course. We hope everyone out there is safe and well. We're now in season three of Scotch Watch, and tonight we will be uh, discussing maturation, a huge topic. So uh, we are looking for your comments, your questions. So please feel free to comment and ask questions throughout. Um, tonight we're actually live from the Blythewood Bar uh, here at our Blythewood Square offices in the heart of Glasgow. No studio audience tonight, but watch this space. Now, you can expect banal banter for about the next 30 minutes or so. That's how long we're going to be on air. Um, tonight's specialist subject is maturation, uh, a huge topic in Scottish whisky at the moment, um, because our casks allow us to play different tunes, of course, uh, within a very strict legal definition. And that's what we want to explore, exactly what is possible uh, within Scotch with uh, director of Blending and Inventory himself, Sandy. Um, Sandy, before we um, do go any further, remind us a little of the, the law on maturation specifically as it stands. Yeah, the, <clears throat> the law, and uh, many people on this call tonight will probably understand that already, but whisky must, whether it be malt or grain whisky, must be matured in oak casks for a minimum of three years. And that maturation must take place in casks that have previously held spirits that have that, that, that have that have historically been used to mature whiskey. So something like rum or a virgin oak cask, a new oak cask like Mizanara or French oak or something like that. So there's the, there are a whole myriad of different casks that can be used for maturation and finishing. But finishing is a finishing is a is an interesting an interesting topic altogether because there are no rules around the length of a finish. You can have a very short finish or a very long finish. There are no laws about that. But the laws that do or the rules that sit around that are the influence of the cask that you're finishing in must never overpower the original whiskey. And conversely, the whiskey must be discernibly changed while still having the whiskey character. So it's quite a it's quite a complicated process that needs to be managed very carefully to protect Scotch whiskey. Yeah, but at a base level, what we're saying is three years. Yep. In oak. Yes. And that three years comes in during uh, the First World War. Okay. Mm -hmm. So that's you know, but it was custom and practice by this point in oak, crucially in Scotland and less than 700 litres. So we know that, and that's that's your starting yeah. point. But what you're saying, crucially, is we must have, it must have historically been used. Yeah. Yes, yes. It's not like you can just put a spirit into a cask and then take it and use it. It needs to be something that has, the spirit has been matured or finished or left in cask historically for a long period of time to justify being able to put whiskey in it and finish it. Ah, OK. And incidentally, cheers, we're enjoying a... a the Glenlivet Caribbean Reserve highball tonight. We thought this was a good example of where you could uh, play a tune with the cask. So is it, is it fair to say, and I don't want to quite use the word loosening of the regulations, but there's certainly more experimentation and you play a key role in that with the Scottish Whiskey Association, yeah, Sandy. Yeah, without a doubt, there has been some good, um, good advancement in allowing to use different different cask types you know tequila for one is one that's been uh, that's been used um, and introduced recently and we've taken advantage of that with the Chivas Regal extra mm -hmm. 13 year old yeah but to your point yes I do I sit on the committee 
of any challenges to new products that have come out and whiskies are sent to me blind to assess to make sure that the the dominant character within the whisky is whisky and it's not completely overpowered by the finishing cask. So that's something that I really enjoy being involved in to, to be able to look at these whiskies, to be able to assess them with other industry experts and then we can make a call whether that finish is, is appropriate for Scotch whisky. So where, where did the change come? This, this was something um, myself and Alan Winchester launched at Glenlivet at 14. And we saw cognac casks come into play there and we were discussing the change. Now you say, as long as the vessel has historically been used to mature that spirit, we can use it within the whisky industry. Absolutely. Did they flex that slightly for us? Was it the time scale that changed? Or is tequila a good example? Tequila is a good example that it was never it was never on the approved list before. But when the records were checked, yes, there were certain tequilas that were kept in cask, matured in cask. So the rules were relaxed on that. The great, the great thing for me was that we were already experimenting out with the rules. So we already had whiskey in tequila casks. And as a, as a, as a blender, as a master blender and working with whiskey, I am actively encouraged by the company to, to, to do things, not just within Scotch whiskey, but out with to experiment, to see if there is, see the impact and see the flavour build up within casks. Yeah, well, listen, we're going to explore all of that. And I want to give you the opportunity to, to ask Sandy some questions on that. You're not going to get this chance again to ask that question about casks, to ask him exactly where. I will join Instagram, incidentally, this side, so I can see the questions coming through, because my site's not that good. I need binoculars. Um, Sandy, um, do please feel free to post your questions. Also, I see so many of you are having highballs. So if you are having a highballs, give me a cheers on the chat yeah. as well so we can see that. I think uh, Ken's having a Valentine's 7 bourbon finish and Coke. Nice. Matt's having a highball out there. We saw Debbie was having one too. Uh, great news. Um, we're going to answer your questions. We're going to explore cask maturation so much deeper and, and answer all of your questions but before turning to our whiskies further cheers karen we're going to move to our regular hobby session uh, which actually remains a part of scotch watch despite considerable opposition uh, so let us know what you're pairing your whiskies with so for those of you who are first time viewers scotch watch came about because sandy is not only passionate about scotch but he's passionate ah marsala finished aberlour my goodness um he's passionate about watches uh, Graham, great to hear from you, CR12 and ICE. Um, Sandy, what watch have you chosen to pair for Scotch Watch tonight? Well, I know self-flattery is no flattery, but tonight I've got something pretty special um, to show everyone. We're talking about maturation, we're talking about finishing, so I've gone for, for, for a real limited edition, high quality, high spec watch. I've gone for a Grand Seiko Spring Drive GMT Worldwide Limited Edition. Now, this watch is really special because I, I, I love the colours of the dial. The colours of the dial just remind me of Aberlour Abuna. It's like, it's like first fill Spanish oak, Oloroso sherry cask. It's got a spring drive movement. It's got that sweeping second hand that doesn't, doesn't jerk or tick. It just moves around really smooth, a bit like the Chivas Extra. But to top it all, we're taking it to another level tonight. This is the first watch ever in my collection that I've changed the strap on, and boy, have I gone for it. And this is all, this is a bit, this parallels to finishing whiskey. This is like taking an, an amazing whiskey and taking it to another level. So tonight we have the Grand Seiko Spring Drive GMT, but we've got it on a custom color matched Hermes strap, just to take it to another level. First time ever in the whole collecting years that I've, um, change the strap on a watch. Just an absolutely magnificent specimen. I'll post a picture of it later on. It's an absolute beauty. And uh, how much? I'm never telling you that, John. <laughs> <laughs> never. <laughs> um, well, great. And I'm also on Instagram now. So if any of our friends on Instagram have got a question, we're live on Zoom and live on Instagram. Please just pose a question there and I will ask that for you. Um, now, my key hobby is music, Sandy. And absolutely. this Christmas... I actually got myself um, a Pioneer DDJ 400 and for the first time since the early 90s, I'm back DJing again and mixing. And it's, it's wonderful because like cast, you can take every single track in a different direction. And I'm also going to do a plug um, for a, a band called Nightworks who beautifully bring together 
traditional Scottish music with that nightclub. So have a look, Nightworks, if you can have a look at them, they are fantastic. So we're going to talk whiskey because I saw a comment there. Now, was it from, let me see, I'm sure I saw a comment from Anish saying he was enjoying. Anyway, on the side, did your family buy your headphones for this as well? Uh, yes, they? yeah, I'm not allowed yeah. to play any music yeah. at all in yeah. public. That's the only issue. Now, we've got a couple of questions and let's go to a question. Um, so uh, Matt from Argentina, uh, great to see you too again, Matthias. Um, what do you think of Malbec casks? Now, um, of course, Matthias is enjoying Royal Salute with Polo Estancia, which is, tell us more about that, selectively finished in Malbec? Yes, yeah, yes, yeah. yes, yes, selectively finished. The, 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 Malbec, the Malbec casks are amazing. They bring really sweet, fruity, jammy notes to the whiskey. The Royal Salute, obviously, is never, is never produced at under 21 years old. So anyway, it's got magnificent, sweet orchard fruit flavours coming through in abundance. But finishing them in these Malbec casks has really just taken it to another level. It's just really raised the game really sweet. But, but something, Alex, you know, finishing is not, is not as simple as some people may think. You know, we, we had to, myself and the blending team had to get samples in. Every four to six weeks, we had to check the flavour impact, make sure that it was com complementing the whisky and not competing with it. Mm -hmm. We wanted to we wanted to make it something that was had had all the Royal Salute family style, but just with an extra layer of flavour coming from these superb Malbec casks. This is a message you're going to hear time and again tonight: is that monitoring of that selective finishing is hugely important. You're talking four to six weeks really labour intensive actually to constantly monitor these casks and look at the influence of the cask on the spirit. And that must be, and I'm just going to throw this in at a moment, Matt is enjoying what, 20, where does that come in, 26? You know, yeah. how do you look after high aged whiskies when you're finishing yeah, in these it, casks because it, it's a risk? Absolutely, and it's, I, I, that's where experimentation comes in. And we brought Malbec casks in from Argentina before we even started the Estancia project. We ran some trials with the cask to see that it was okay. So your, your question and your point's a mm -hmm. really good one. We wouldn't just delve in and take the whole spirit, put it into these casks and say, hey ho, I hope this works out all right. Mm -hmm. It's about, and, and, and finishing, is, finishing is about, depending on the age, your point about age is a great point. When, when, when you're finishing in older whiskies, they need that little bit longer to let that influence come through. But also every single cask that we, that we use for finishing, whether it be rye, rum, tequila, whether it be sherry, PX, each one of them, rum in particular, is one of the fastest finish. You need to watch it really carefully so that you don't let it overpower. So each one of these takes different times. So you need to monitor it really closely. Guys, this is fascinating. Think of that when you bring that dram, okay? You're trying it, you're looking at the aroma and flavour. Think of that, monitoring that constant checking, making sure it's not dominating. And Sandy, we'll get some great questions. So I'm going to go off script and go straight to the questions. Yep, I know you're surprised that this is scripted. <laughs> um, believe me, it's scripted and rehearsed. So we have a question on Instagram from Haisif Ali. Haisif, great question. Do you believe that other type of woods will be used? We know this can be used in Irish whiskey, for example, um, to mature scotch in the near future, Sandy. Yeah, good question. Um, I think that um, I, I'm going to be open and honest because we're among friends tonight. I'm already experimenting out with scotch. At the moment, if we were to launch that whiskey, it would be a spirit drink. But I think there is there is scope over time for us to introduce different different casks varieties other than oak. So yes, we are experimenting. Yes, I think there is an opportunity to do something like that. But at the moment, the laws are very strict, and in some respects, help protect Scotch whisky, but won't allow me in any shape or form to use anything other than oak. Well, here's a question. It's great from House of doing my job tonight, co-host. Um, would you like to have the liberty to use other casks? Yes, I think I would, yes, yeah. Right, let's timestamp that so we can get that on social media tomorrow. Um, just a welcome to a few people. Jenna from the US, great to see you. Nut joining us in from Scandinavia. Sim joining us from India. We've got people from all over the world. Um, thank you for joining us. And Sim, we'll go to your question. Um, your favorite cask finish, Sandy, and why? I, I love the rum finish of Glenlivet Caribbean Reserve. I think it's just amazing. We spent so much time finding the right Caribbean rum 
to, to, to complement that Glenlivet fruity floral style. We wanted something that would be that, that would have that sort of almost almost I, I'm trying I'm, Caribbean to be to be to, to, to be to be sort of pineapple, tropical. Tropical's the word I'm looking for. I wanted a, something tropical to overlay it, overlay it. And if, if I'm to be absolutely honest, I had absolutely no appreciation when we started working at how quickly it would work and how quickly you could get caught out and have something that was completely swamped with rum flavour and lose all that wonderful Glenlivet distillate character. So, yeah, my favourite my favorite is the, the, the rum finish. I love working with the rum casks. Fast and amazing quality. Well, Sim, you heard it here first, and I'm enjoying a Caribbean eating reserve right now. And actually, our friends on Instagram for a second, um, Hyseth was saying that he's in the Chapel Town Whiskey Club in Sheffield. So a big shout out to them is DJ C. You see that? <laughs> okay. um, um, and Tolga, uh, superb to see you uh, on from Turkey. And Gordy's FaceTime, a good friend who's lost count of the number of Shivers Regal bottles he's bought now. Uh, Gordy's um, God a big fan of the Caribbean Reserve as well. I'm just going to keep these questions going, but first I'm going to launch a poll to see which of the whiskies that we have out there you would most like to try at the moment. So that poll is now live. Let me know which of the whiskies you would most like to try that we've introduced with the finish, and that's for our audience on Zoom. So please take a look at that and vote. Um, let's see, the answers are coming in. We'll oh, come back. Fast and furious. We'll come back to that in a moment um, once everyone's participated. Karen has a great question. Let's see. Karen is asking anything you can tell us about innovation in the pipeline. Give, um, if you can, Sandy, an indication of how many projects you might be working on at any one time. Yeah, in, in, in the blending room, myself and the team have 134 individual experiments going on at the moment. It's something that is, you know, in, in the blending room, we're, we're managing the quality and the continuity of the whiskies that, that, that have a, an amazing heritage but we are really experimenting. The, the, the thirst for new whiskies, new expressions is unprecedented, way more. You know, I started in the industry back in the 1980s and we were lucky if we did one new innovation a year. Now, the thirst for knowledge, the, people want to try different expressions, people want to know about them, they want to understand. So the great, the great thing about working with Shivas is the fact that I'm, I, I, as I said earlier, I'm actively encouraged to experiment to try different things and there is there is absolutely no pressure on me if something doesn't work and I think you learn lots from these different experiments and it helps you with other projects to do different things. Yes yeah and listen we see a lot you know you know at the start I said you can play different tunes mm -hmm. obviously with scotch all we have to play with really is the new spirit and that's a long wait you then have age Yep. to play with the cask is predominant is that is that fair is that is that where you turn to for innovation yeah i i think the cask the cask plays a, a much much bigger role than some people may realize you know and it's not just it's not just that first fill cask it's that second fill it's that third fill cask we have some amazing whiskies like Shivers Regal 25 year old, Ballantine's 30, Royal Salute 38 year old. These whiskies need to be managed carefully because that cask during maturation will impart a lot of flavour. So you need to make sure you manage it so that that distillate character is in perfect balance. So using a second or a third fill cask on a long maturation is absolutely the thing to do. You do not want too much oak overpowering the flavour of the whiskey. Mm -hmm. Great to see an Instagram, our friend RJ Kama joining from over in Canada oh, as excellent. well. Excellent, RJ, um, good to see you. And, and we have had lots of um, innovation in the past year. You know, Scotch Watch is back. We've had Ballantines playing with bourbon influence. We've had the Glenlivet Cognac and Caribbean rum. Shivers with rye and tequila. Royal Salute with Argentinian Malbec casks. Just to look at the results, it was fairly fairly level from what you're trying. Ballantine 7 bourbon finish in fourth place. Royal um, Shivers Regal Tequila Tart Cask in third place. Caribbean Reserve in fourth and out front Royal Salute Polo Estancia. Um, a great choice. Sandy, what's driving this obsession with casks? I think people want to know, want, want to try different flavours. People are much, much more consumers. People who drink whiskey are much, much more inquisitive. They want to know more about how you've made the whiskey. They want to try. They'll, they'll always fall back to their classic expression, like Glenlivet 12-year-old, Ballantine's Finest, Chivas Regal 12. These are absolute classics with amazing history. 
but people want to try different expressions. They want to try things as well. They want to try a new flavour. And someone, that, that is absolutely first and foremost in my mind, when I'm making a new expression like Glenlivet, Caribbean Reserve, I want it to have that Glenlivet classic foundation, but just with an extra twist, just to tempt people who love Glenlivet. I, I think that's something I would like to discuss, and I'm sure I'm going to stand now. I'm used to sitting at a bar, of course. Um, I'd like to look at that because... What interests me is the Scottish whisk industry is so tightly protected, yet on the bottle we will see the Glenlivet 15 French Oak Reserve, we will see selectively matured, we will see selectively finished, and I know, you know, uh, we have a team of fantastic ambassadors in 30 countries around the world, Absolutely. and the message is, what does that mean? So yeah. what are these terms, Sandy? What is most yeah, consistent? Yeah, that, that, that's, that's a good question, and, and obviously fully finished means that you've taken a blend or a single malt and you've taken it out of the casks, you've put it together and you've taken every single drop of that whiskey and finished it in a second exotic, different flavoured cask. And that is a full finish. A selective finish is something that we introduce if the whisk, we feel that the cask influence could be at risk of being too quick, too strong, too overpowering. So we will, something like Shivas Extra, let's call say rye, we would, yeah. take, we would take the blend, we would make a blend at 13 years old, and then we would take a portion of that blend out and put a portion of it into okay. the rye casks. Leave it, monitor it for a period of time, then take that portion back and add it back to the original batting. Okay. So that gives you a selective finish within the whiskey. Okay, and that prevents that, the, the original spirit dominating it gives me and my team a bit of control over the flavour. It's all about control and not letting it completely take over. I, I like this from a sort of associated question from Ari. Sorry if, if my pronunciation is wrong. Oh. So assuming it would have been allowed if you were actually to mix in rum, tequila, sherry into whiskey, how much of the addition would overtake the natural distill distillate? It'd be pretty powerful, wouldn't it? It would be pretty powerful, and and remember that second that second finish would would not be as it would it, it would it would be too a direct addition. It's a much much more smoother addition finishing it in the cask because you get that sweet a bit of sweet vanilla creaminess coming from the cask as well, particularly with things like rum and things. If you were just to add rum directly into it. I, it would be it would be too too coarse for me. It needs to be a bit smoother, a wee bit more sophisticated than that. But 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 a cracking a cracking question um, from a from from an expert that I'll be seeing in the next couple of weeks in a, in Dumbarton. Oh, good. Watch this space. Well, from Dumbarton to Russia, we've already said we have the US, Scandinavia, India, now Russia on. Uh, Artem, great to see you. Is there a problem? with high quality sherry barrels in the whiskey industry right now? A really hot topic, Sandy. Um, not for me, I'm all right. <laughs> <laughs> um, I've, had, I've had a relationship with the um, cask supplier that gives us our sherry casks for decades. In fact, I don't even consider him just a supplier, I consider him a friend. Um, he has been brilliant at managing our quality. We're buying, we're only buying Spanish oak, Oloroso sherry casks certificated now and these casks we even specify the sherry that is used to condition the casks. We are not just buying empty casks that are available in Spain where sherry has been emptied. We are making arrangements with our supplier to buy oak, to take those casks, to dry the oak, to fill them with sherry, condition them with sherry, then empty them, then bring them to Scotland only in the winter months to make sure there's no risk with the hot weather and then fill them with the casks filled within five to seven days of hitting the ground in Scotland mm. to make sure they're not lying empty for too long. It's, it, it's, it's a big job to manage all that. I'm very lucky. Douglas Campbell is my um, cask manager and he is all over it to make sure that there is no risk to the whiskey. You can't go back the way, you can't sort it out if you've made a mistake. So let's do all the work at the front end to make sure it's absolutely perfect. So this is great, keeping these questions coming because it's saving me trying to read my script and, and look like I'm not reading a script. So that's perfect. Um, thank you for that question. Uh, Matt, who's our ambassador over in the Netherlands, um, any um, Chivas blends? A huge amount going on in Chivas. We've got cognac, tequila, rum, rye, bourbon. Yeah. Is yeah. there room for anything else? 
Yeah, there's always room for something else. There's always room for something else. There's always room for something else within or with, out with the rules. There's lots of stuff going on. Unfortunately, I, I can't I can't spill the beans at the moment, but we'll keep that for another Scotch watch once we're a little bit further down the road. Now, I'm just going to go to Instagram. We've got about eight questions in the, the Q&A. We're going to go to quarter to eight tonight. We will get through as many of your questions as we can. Okay, um, uh, Lewis, thank you. An amazing bar setup. Yep, it's great to be back. Um, uh, Lewis is also saying, is there a cask finish that you're particularly interested in experimenting with? Yeah, I, I think, obviously, I was... I was you no know, pivotal in bringing Mizanara into the business, and that was that was super interesting to be able to tie in a trip to Japan to go to a cooperage and set up a, a relationship with a cooperage and bring these casks into Scotland and to to fill them and experiment before we launched Chivas Mizanara. I think I'm, I, I I I can't stress it enough how keen we are to try different cask types all the time. You know, we, we have an endless supply of casks coming in, and we're really keen to try different things so I, I, to answer the question directly I'm really lucky that there is a budget for me to go and buy whatever is available or whatever I fancy doing to be able to put us on the front foot when it comes to making a new new product development. There's another timestamp. stamp <laughs> um, and Frank uh, our good friend of course from Toronto from Russia to Canada I'm um, saying regarding Shivas Casa, 25 year old superb, and the Mizanara is just, I mean, I'm sure everyone would agree, Mizanara, Japanese oak, absolutely stunning. Right, let's get through all your questions, folks. Um, I don't, so not, not sorry, you're absolutely right. There's not much peated in the portfolio, it's not our style. Nope. We're using casks, so, uh, which previously held peated spirit. Um, yeah, particularly for Scapa Glanza um, and the Glenlivet Nadura. We're taking, we're taking the spirit, blending it together when it's mature, bringing the whiskies together when it's mature, then returning it to casks that have previously held peated whiskey. And I, I, I like it, Alex. It's, it, mm -hmm. it's actually quite sophisticated to be able to get it. It's not, it's not one-dimensional, full-on, smoky, medicinal peat. You get a bit of that space-side character just complemented perfectly with a bit of bonfire smoke. It just works really well for us, and that's why we do it both with the Scapa Glanza and with the Glenlivet Nadura. But you need to watch it carefully, don't you? Because oh, I, yes. I understand you're looking at those casts. You spoke about 46 weeks with Malbec, yeah. but they're yeah. every two weeks, aren't yeah, they? Yeah, you, you've, got, you've got yeah. You've got to be all over it because they can. you can end up with something really smoky. And particularly, Glenlivet's a more delicate style, quite mm -hmm. sophisticated whiskey. If you're putting it in a, you're putting it in a, in a, a, a smoky, peaty cask, you need to watch it, you need to have those samples coming in all the time so that you can stop. And even sometimes the bottling date will be really far out and we'll say, well, we can't wait then because it's going to be too smoky. So we'll take the whiskey out of those casks and put them into other casks to stop the smoky influence. Mm -hmm. So continue with the questions from Debbie. Um, any plans to bring back the amazing Loch Anora? People loved it, didn't they? It was a, a, a great, great spirit. Yeah, it's super, super tasty, super sweet. Um, it's uh, no, we don't have plans, Debbie, at the moment to bring it back. Um, but there is a real hardcore that love it. And anecdotally, um, I, I see that it's going for huge amounts of money on um, on auction sites now. So our marketing team really need to take heed of that and see if it's worth resurrecting yeah, it. And I, I can guarantee Debbie will know of any left. That sure, Deb. Um, <laughs> You know, because um, I try to sell a load of dogs. Yeah. Um, is there a, so, Sim, this was a crucial question I was waiting coming up. Well, ask oh. Sim, um, is there a minimum duration for selective casks finish, e.g. Uh, uh, Chivas Eggs being cognac casks? Um, good that's, question. It's a good, it's a good question. Um, is there a minimum duration? No, it's all about the flavour impact. It's not about the time. It's about the flavour impact. It's about making sure that that balance, that balance of flavour coming through from the cask is just perfect. Um, there are no rules about that minimum. You can, it can be, but it must make the whisky discernibly different from the original maturation. And our, our amazing uh, ambassador Caris is enjoying a Glenlivet 15 year old in Glasgow. Nice um, one, Caris. Can you tell us a bit about that French oak reserve? 15 year old, incidentally, is my favourite single malt and one of our favourite whiskies. And I think you just got amazing structure. You, you touched on it earlier, Sandy. You yeah. just run over that again. Yeah, the, the, 
that the 15 year old French Oak Reserve is something that's it's really quite special, Alex, because we're bringing we're bringing in virgin oak spa, uh, virgin oak French casks that have never held anything before. So when you fill the whiskey into those casks, you get some amazing um, toasted, spicy, nutty flavours coming from the yes. coming from the wood. And 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 again, and I, I sound a bit like a broken record, can be really pungent and strong. So you need to manage it, and that's why we take a portion of it fill it into those casks, then add it back to the original vatting to give the flavour. But it's lovely. You need to be careful, Glenn, it's delicate. The flavour's not, it's not one of those heavy, meaty, beefy whiskies. It's really quite sophisticated. It's, it, it's sweet, it's floral, it's got some amazing pear notes. You want to complement that with the French oak, you don't want it competing with it. Ah, superb. Okay, quick fire questions. We've got about 15 minutes remaining. We've got nine questions outstanding and a load in the chat. So, Sandy, I'm going to put you on the spot. Aberlour Abuna is a favourite of Rune. Any news from Aberlour? We know we've got Alba now, yeah? Yeah, we've got Aberlour Alba, which is 100% first fill, um, first fill American oak barrels. Um, I have been doing some experimentation with different casks from Spain um, that may give us something different from Aberlour Abuna to just take it to another level. Yeah, that, that, so watch this space for Abuna because we know it's got a cult following. Mm -hmm. um, absolutely amazing. And it shows the power of the Oloroso casks, doesn't it? In that oh, process yeah. she spoke yeah, about yeah, earlier. Yeah. Let, let, let's, just, let's just pause on Aberlour Abuna. You know, Aberlour Abuna is cask strength, non-chill filtered, 100% matured in first fill Spanish oak Oloroso sherry butts. It does exactly what it says on the tin. Yeah. It, is, it, it has its credentials are fabulous, and that shows through in the final whiskey. Yes, absolutely stunning. Okay, Alison yeah. up at Shathila Distillery. Please take the opportunity to visit the team there. Absolutely wonderful distillery and a wonderful team. Great question, Alison. So, a lot of people enjoy a second fill. I know you're a huge yeah, fan of a second fun, fill, but the vast. How long would a butt have been used for a first fill before getting to that stage? It's a good yeah, question. Yeah, what a cracking question. Um, probably, probably on a long maturation, the first the first fill would probably be about between ten and twelve years. First fill ten and twelve years, then on to the second fill. At the risk of going way too techy tonight, when we bring a cask into our inventory, we put a small metal tag on it, and that metal tag has the year that it came into the inventory. So all the casks that are coming in from Spain, sherry butts at the moment will be, have a tag put on them with 2022 on them. When that cask is empty and refilled again, it will be given a blue tag and another blue tag, then maybe a red tag if it's going for green. From that, I can count up how many times it's been filled and when it came into the inventory. So we're able to manage how much quality potential or maturation potential that cask has left in it. So it's it's something unique to Shivas Brothers, unique to our company, but it's something that, it's that extra level of confidence that we want to manage the quality and the impact from the cask. So there you have it, Alison, 10 to 12 years, you know, typically we're looking yep. elsewhere, but then what's the impact? And listen, I'm, I'm, I'm a huge fan of a second fill as well. Yeah, me Paul, too. Paul, Paul Main, thank you for joining us. I know you're doing great whiskey tastings yourself. So thank you for that. And listen, will we see Scapa 16 again? I'm sure everyone's asking that question. What a cracking question. Will yeah. we see Scapa 16? If I've got anything to do with it, Paul, well, you certainly will. Okay. Yeah. Watch this space. And Paul, I know we'll get the chance to meet uh, with Sandy again in the future, so you can hold him to that. Okay. Um, Max, uh, Chivas Mexico. Um, everyone loves a pun. Um, with tequila casks being such a success in Mexico, look, look at the international audience we have on tonight. It's fantastic, know, Sandy. It's great. We're all over the world. Um, is there a chance in the future to use other agave based spirit casks? Um, and not solely tequila. Yep, there is absolutely. Um, it's about it's about sourcing the right type of casks. Um, I'm quite fastidious when it. When I'm I'm not just going to bring in any old cask that's been lying about in Mexico. It's got to be freshly emptied, and sometimes they're hard to get. But yes, uh, we are experimenting with other with other spirit types that have been matured in casks. So yeah, watch this space. Max is offering up his contacts. Do you like that? Is it? Yeah. <laughs>
top man. I'll phone you tomorrow, Max. He's okay. a top man, and I, th- I think Gordy's asking us a rhetorical question: Is the energy price is going to impact? Do I need to buy more Caribbean Reserve now? Um, absolutely, Gordy. Thank yeah. you for I'm that. A bit, one. I'm a bit worried about you, Gordy. You need to stop <laughs> buying the Caribbean Reserve. <laughs> right. um, now, Ken, Ken, great to hear from you uh, out in Houston. Uh, what type of innovation do you think would really break the mould within our Scottish range? And how do you think this would be communicated? Do you think we've done that already, actually? Yeah, I think we have. I think the Chivas, the Chivas X 13-year-old extra range is, is quite is quite quite unique as a as a, a portfolio of experimental flavours. And we also have the Chivas 18-year-old ultimate cask collections where we go and source exotic casks and we fill every single drop of whiskey into them and have to monitor it closely. I think there's it's a good question, Ken, and I think I think we're actively um, experimenting in the background. We just have to get agreement from the people who control the rules and regulations to allow us to go forward as a scotch, or we just bite the bullet and make it a spirit drink. Right, we have eight minutes remaining because well, largely because I've booked a restaurant nearby. But um, <laughs> we're, we're here as long as you're here. Um, I'm staying with Ken because he's asked a question that I was going to ask earlier. And we're both fascinated by the options offered by cask finishing. You're part of that panel. What would not count as a cask maturation, what would fall outside the rules, Sandy? Something like cider or something like that. Oh, yeah. Cider, cider cask would fall out, out with that. And something... something beer? Uh, no, beer. We, we, we have done a fair bit of experimentation with beer. Um, beer needs to be managed really carefully, Alex, because you get quite a lot of sulphur notes mm. in beer. And there's a fair bit of sediment, but there's not nearly as much beer goes into cask as people might think. So casks are not, are not in abundance for doing whiskey finishes in beer. So no, it's something that's not readily available. We do have them and we have some good relationships with some of the breweries, um, but it's not something that's done as much as people would think. Okay, okay. So cider is a very good example. Yeah, that's a good example. Yeah, or something that's never been, you know, something, I'm using an extreme example, something like vodka or something like that, that has never, ever, ever been produced or put in a cask. So you would never be allowed to use a cask that had previously contained vodka or maybe gin as well. You wouldn't be allowed to use something like that. Sure, sure. Okay, Danny, thank you. And what do you think of the latest Talisker experiment with finishing cast charred by flames of marine oak and kelp? Yeah, it's interesting. It's interesting. We we have a we have a a whiskey called um, Ballantine's Barrel Smooth, uh, which used to be called Hard Fired, and we used to, we, we we take freshly emptied casks and we char them. And the char, it's, it's really interesting because to take a new cask in America, when new casks are made in America and they're charred, the casks are bone dry. But to take a cask that's previously held whiskey and to rechar it, it's amazing because it burns really, really intensely because of the alcohol in the walls of the cask. And you get a really deep char and you get some really sweet vanilla flavour. So, yes, we've, 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 we've done some experimentation ourselves. It, it, it's an amazing thing to see, to see that. When you fire the cask, mm. you get the blue flames off the alcohol. Then when that blue alcohol burns off, you then get the orange flames. It's, it's, it's an art in itself. And I've been at the Cooperage when they're doing it. Each cask takes a different time to burn. Do you know what, folks? This is absolutely dynamite. Nowhere else other than Scottish Watch where you get this level of detail on cask maturation on Scottish whisky. That's why we're uncovering whisky one dram and one story at a time. Okay, we will be back soon. Sandy, I'm putting you in the spot. We've got five minutes remaining, a load of questions. Chris Brusso, we hear the cask contributes to colour and up to 60% of flavour. What do you think? Yeah, good, good question, Chris. Um, 60% of flavour, I would say it contributes to 60% of flavour when you get to something like Valentine's 30 year old or Chivas Regal 25. Um, around about the sort of 12 year old, if you're using really good quality casks, probably 40, 45% of the flavour contribution. Now remember, if you're using casks that have been used many, many times before, the flavour impact will not come through as high as that. So anytime we're talking about that sort of level, 60%, we're talking about using first fill casks 
and getting that maximum flavour impact from the maturation. Can I also say welcome to the team on Instagram Live too. We are on yeah. Zoom over here. Great to see Alan Galloway join us, a, a very yeah. good friend Super of us girl. both. Tommy MacArthur, great to see you too. Paul and uh, Rachel RVJ Drinks joining us too on Instagram. Thank you, team, and everyone else. Okay, um, on to a good friend of Scotch Watch. He's been here since day one. Um, so um, deserves a bottle. Uh, Gregor, two good questions from Gregor. First, are X sherry casks expensive? And secondly, do you think it's good that Scotch is protected the way it is? A nice broad question, that. Um, sherry casks are expensive. In fact, we're just renewing our contracts for them at the moment, and I would describe them as eye-wateringly expensive at the moment. But if you want to keep your quality and your continuity right, you just need to bite the bullet. We're really fortunate, as I said before, we've got long-term relationship with our cask supplier. Um, there are no issues with that, and we know we're going to get really good, and we know he's fair with us on price. Everything is struggling at the moment on price. Um, we need to manage it carefully, we need to look into it and make sure that we're getting the right casks and if it does cost us more, we just need to bite the bullet to keep the flavour the same. Yeah, and, and Ken's expanded on that by saying, well listen, it's a huge investment, isn't it? Yeah, uh, it's, it, it's a massive. Casks. Yeah, and I can't, I can't stress that we spend tens of millions of pounds every year in Chivas Brothers, every single year on fresh casks coming into the inventory. Um, so a couple of questions to finish. Um, Matthias in Argentina, are you thinking of making a Shivers Calvados edition? That would be brilliant, don't you think? You've been, you've been looking through my registers, you know, all my books. Well, I need to, need to make sure that everything's under lock and key. <laughs> hey, love it, love it. Thank you. So there's no open questions. I'm going to go to Instagram and Colin Mayers. Any thoughts on the use of Apera, which is Australian sherry casks? Hmm, interesting. No, I've not. I've not used any of those. No, no. Interesting. But I've, I'm going to jot it down. Yeah, if you can source those for us, yeah. Colin. Uh, sounds like a yeah. good plan. Um, I'm going to finish with a question from our master distiller at Aberlour, Graham Cruikshank. Great to have Graham online, um, folks. Welcome, Graham Cruikshank, the, the man behind Aberlour. Um, I'm going to go to Matt with a broad question, moving slightly away from casks, but still relevant. Single malts versus blends, Sandy. Um, Matt's coming across a stereotypical whiskey snob who believes that perhaps single malts dominate. Um, what do you say? Over to you. I'm just going to take a well, seat. All right, all right. <laughs> well, well, what, 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 let's be controversial, Alex. Single malt's not nearly as single as people think it is. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, when we're making Glenlivet 12 years old, we're using spirit that's 12, 13 and 14 year old. We're using barrels, we're using hogsheads, we're using butts, we're using first fill, we're using second fill. The recipe, the formula for Glenlivet 12 year old is probably more complicated than some pretty simple non-age mm -hmm. blends. Mm -hmm. So it does have a level of complexity, but nothing compared to a blended whiskey. Mm -hmm. You know, a blended whiskey is using many different malts and grains, using different cask types. You're putting these together in the right flavours with fingerprint malts, like Chivas Regal, we're using Longmorn, we're using Strathyla, the other thing, then we build it up with that. We've got Strathclyde grain, predominantly matured in American oak barrels. When you bring that together, you're going to get a myriad of flavours. Single malt's amazing. If you love the flavour of a single malt, that's the one for you. But it's not as complex as what you're going to get from a blended whiskey. Yeah, great answers, yeah, and it's about that complexity, and you know what I love to do, Matt? Something that I adore doing, and sorry, Sandy, you just said a hello from Watch Addict. Oh, nice. Um, from what one Watch Addict to another. Um, Matt, my favourite tool, always blind taste. Put them yeah. side by side and blind taste. Yeah. Never, my, my hot tip for this evening is never finish the bottle of whiskey your own. Leave a little bit in it and keep it for comparison for the next one you're going to open. Do that, it makes it so much easier to be able to tell, oh, how much smoke are in these whiskies? How much sherry influence is in there? How much is the fruitiness in there? What is the cask influence? It's almost, it's helping your brain tell the difference between these whiskies. Always keep a little bit of the last bottle, keep it to compare to the new one that you're going to open. It helps, it helps improve your vocabulary and improve the way you can nose and smell and differentiate flavours. And, and, and thanks to Johnny, who's saying fantastic episode, lads, mouth-watering. Uh, great to hear. Thank you. Um, okay. Um, 
I would like to finish, I think it's a great way to finish on the American barrel. The American barrel is the workhorse of the Scotch whisky industry. Absolutely. Um, you know, we've got the wonderful Secret Space Side range, which of course uses and yeah. great to see online, Marta, through that in there. Um, we talk about all that also, we've spoken about Sherry, Mizanara, but, you know, a good American barrel, Sandy. And, and what, what Graham's saying is there. Is there um, what Graham's saying? Is there somewhere? Is there a, a an American bar or a bourbon that you particularly enjoy getting in? Yeah, we have over the over the past couple of years. We've been bringing in some selective, and we're incredibly lucky at Shivers Brothers to have Rabbit Hole TX in our portfolio yeah, and yeah. Jefferson in our portfolio. So all of a sudden, I'm not having to go to brokers to buy casks. We have these casks mm -hmm. getting emptied within our within our business. So I brought quite a few of those casks in, not just bourbon, rye as well. We've tried some you know, amazing whiskies that we've been experimenting with. So this goes back to my 130, 140 experiments. There's a whole myriad of stuff going on where we're, we're, we're experimenting, trying things and making sure that the, the flavour is right before we start scaling up into something that would be a new product offering. Well, folks, I hope you enjoyed that. Um, please feel free to comment. We'd love to hear from you. Um, we do hope to see you live, those of you that we can. Um, thoroughly enjoyed being back the first scotch watch of the new year season three episode one on maturation there's a lot more to come uh, we're going to be looking more closely at music and watches in the months ahead sandy over to you for a few final words on scotch watch and maturation it's fabulous to be back it's good that we're in the one room now yep <laughs> just the job just the job um i'm overwhelmed by the amount of questions tonight. It's been great, it's made the episode for me. It's not just Alex and I pontificating about maturation. People have asked relevant questions and I love that and we should continue in that vein. Hit us with the questions, we're not frightened to answer them. Give us them every episode, loved it. Yeah, and a happy new year to Single Malt Dom too. A good new year to you and Frank, thank you. Uh, great to hear from you. Thank you for your kind words, folks. We'll be back next month. Um, with a live event here in Blyswood. We will film and record that event and post it on YouTube. Um, this episode will be up, go up on YouTube too, once I've had a careful edit of it. <laughs> Remember to follow us both on Instagram. Sandy's at Whiskey Blender Dude. I'm at Whiskey Alexander. So thanks for joining Scotch Watch, uncovering whiskey, one dram and one story at a time. All the best. It's and Slanger. Cheers, folks. Cheers. Have a great night. And thanks for joining.